Hi, my name is Amedeo Beretta, and in this video I'm going to go through the process of animating an entire shot from one of the cinematic clips of the couch co-op game River Tales from Kid Onion Studio. To begin with, let's have a look at the final composited result first. Before I go on explaining how I made the animation, if you are interested in the game itself, a demo is already available. You can download the free alpha demo on itch.io. Check the links in the video description. You can also support them on Kickstarter. This is not going to be a click by click tutorial, but rather an overview of the process and reasoning leading to a finished animated shot consisting of both creature animation and acting performance. I will show at which stage I presented the first blocking to the director and will detail both the choices leading to and from that moment. Meanwhile, I will mention the main techniques involved. The video covers about 17 hours worth of animation work, meaning the footage goes on average at about 20 times the actual speed. A timer on the top right corner of the screen will indicate at which point an action is being performed. The actual delivery of the shot took a few hours longer though, because of some tweaks I had to do on the rig as I progressively found out issues and bugs while animating. However, this being a fairly long video, I did not include the rig troubleshooting part in the recording. As part of my work, I record animation tutorials, which at the moment you can find on either Skillshare or Udemy.com. The first 10 people to click on the link in the description will gain free access to my latest tutorial on how to animate an anime-inspired stylized run on Udemy.com. Alternatively, you can click on the Skillshare promo link to gain one month free premium access to Skillshare and thus access all of my tutorial on the same platform along with those of other instructors. Now back to the cinematic clip. As a first step, I asked the director to write the story they wanted to tell or to line up some sketches on a timeline supported by provisional sounds. This will form the base of my work and gives me a good idea whether the actions the director wants to show on screen can be realistically portrayed within the length of the clip. In this specific case, it effectively acts as a 2D animatic. You would normally have one in a regular movie before animating. When discussing my engagement with the project, we agreed with the director that having an animated storyboard would have been an efficient starting point for any non-gameplay animated clip. You're not always so lucky as to have that material before starting animation, but the entire project is built on a very tight budget and this approach is the most effective one I could think of. What? Boom. Boop. Bloop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rivertail. Bling. Rivertail, a natural cop adventure. So this was the storyboard Francesco and Gabriele prepared for me. The storyboard was really, really helpful, in fact. The first thing I want to do is to have the storyboard in the scene of Maya as a reference for timing and framing. That gives me a very good head start on the work. I have prepared a little bit of a simple rig for the trunk, but I really realized that the proportions were a bit off and I needed some more controls and I realized that of course after having the storyboard in the scene. Also I went on to creating a bunch of selection sets so that while animating it would have been a lot easier to work with the characters and the first thing I did was to import the animation swimming loop for the fish. Uh, you don't see it there but I have three monitors. In fact in this very brief section I'm moving the recording to the bottom right where I have studio library open. I use studio library to import the swimming animation and then I retime it to fit what's needed by the shot. I used the graph editor scale tool to scale the animation and make it faster or slower and I just dragged the keys on the timeline to shift them left and right. The swimming animation, the swimming loop was something I developed for the in-game part so it was already a loop I animated earlier on. At the time of animating this, I really thought that the log was one of the main characters of the shot and the core of the animation because every interaction between the two characters revolved around where the log was at which time, so I started blocking out the log first. And I wrote a little snippet of code to toggle the stepped preview on and off through a shortcut. 
So I got a very basic blocking of the log. I have this swimming loop going into the log itself. So it's time to take care of the cat itself. At this stage, I also stopped for a second to evaluate whether it was making sense to purchase Animbot. If I were in a company, I would have Animbot in there and the company probably would pay for it. But if I am on my own, then it's a cost I have to absorb. Eventually, I will purchase Animbot for this very shot. But at the beginning, I wasn't quite convinced. And I had a bunch of tools that I used instead of Animbot. I ended up settling for the Echo version of Animbot, which was a bit of a bummer because after purchasing it, I realized that the Echo version doesn't have the latest features and the latest features were actually the things that I couldn't do with the tools I had. So I felt a bit underwhelmed by the purchase. Anyhow, Animbot is actually very practical and it made the animation process much easier to the point that I did ask the author for a discount for you guys. It's not an affiliate link and I actually didn't use the discount myself. If you use the discount code animation pandemic during checkout you will get ten dollars off the pro eco or lifetime versions and we have to thank alan camillo for this so i have the log i have the fish and now i'm working on the pose of the cat and after a few clicks i do realize that i don't know how a cat can sit although i do have a cat at home so i'm starting looking for references and i do use pure ref for this task i just think it's very fast as a tool and after I have enough pictures of sitting cats, I can start sculpting the pose a little bit better and devise something a bit more informed. In the process, I'm also devising a little bit of the facial pose, but I realize it's going to take me a while longer. So I'm going to cannibalize the previous shot I animated and grab the facial pose from there. I can export and import the pose back thanks to Studio Library, which is free. And I think the idea of the director of the cat licking its own paw at the beginning of the animation is quite cool. I think I'm going to go for that. It's pretty difficult to pose a character with a head this big because whenever you lift the arm, the arm is going to go into the head area. The head is essentially a big balloon. So I'm going to cheat a lot of the positions in general, but you see how I work out the pose in 3D and then I check it from the camera. The camera is really, really important, of course, but I want the pose to work in 3D to begin with because eventually this cat will have to move around the scene and spin around itself. And if the 3D pose doesn't make sense, it will be more difficult to perform the splining. Due to the size of the head, I'm actually extending the arm a little bit longer so that the arm can actually reach forward without getting into the volume of the head, which is massive, as I said. Also, I'm really trying to break the symmetry of the ears. I think if I manage to give them some sort of line of action, I can give this cat a lot more character and a lot more mood to the pose. I was trying to figure out what could have been the best pose for the tail and eventually I decided to lay it onto the log. There you go, and now I have the pose. And here you see I'm using an embody. Actually, I'm using the trial in this part of this video because I'm still checking whether I can work without it and use my tools instead. But by the time of the first half of the animation, I will be pretty convinced Animbot is the way to go. Unfortunately for me, the trial actually has all the features, while the Echo version doesn't have all the features. So in practice, when I switched from trial to Echo version, I lost some of the features and I did lose the selection sets, which I didn't expect to. I decided to keep the spine in IK for this animation because I thought this way I could stretch and squish it a little bit. The characters are not designed to be ultra stretchy. While posing the tail, I realized there was a little bug on the rig, so I went back and fixed it. And in here, I'm going back to a previous animation I made just to cannibalize yet another animation pose. In here, I'm thinking maybe I can reuse the blink and the facial expressions. So again, I'm using Studio Library to export those. And I want to create the first pose for the cat, the starting pose in which the cat is licking his paw. And then I want to create the second important pose, which is when the cat realizes something went off. And I want to have a difference in the line of action between the two poses. The first one needs to be pretty relaxed. The second one needs to be pretty alert. And there needs to be contrast between these two poses because the character is not that big on screen, if you think of it. And the audience needs to be able to read the change of emotion straight from the silhouette. Once I have the two poses, I can go back to the fish and animate the action of the fish getting stuck in the log. 
And in order to animate something like this, I first need the storytelling pose, which is the one of the fish stuck in the log. After that pose, I will need to wiggle the tail as much as I can to simulate the fact that I'm trying to get free. And you see that I'm doing the wiggling of the tail on an animation layer because I already have the loop underneath with the tail swinging left and right for the regular swim cycle. But at this stage, I just need it to be more and a bit different. So I'm using the animation that I'm recycling from another shot and just making it wider. In the meantime, I also realized that I need a little bit of a tweak to the rake of the log. And now I can start working on the third pose of the cat, which is the pose in which the cat realizes that something happened. And that's something that happened because of the movement of the log as a result of the fish hitting it. Right now, I'm kind of approaching the blocking in a straight ahead fashion, but I'm not doing any transition. Although I do have animation on the fish, for instance, because of the fact that I am recycling an animation that already existed. After the cat realizes that something is strange because of the bump in the log, the cat is going to have a pose in which it looks to the back, notices the fish, and then jumps towards the fish to observe it up close. Once I have the starting pose of the cat and the landing pose, I can start figuring out what the breakdowns are going to be. So I will need a pose in which the, f the cat rotates a little bit and I will need some references for the jump of the cat because although I do have a cat back home, I really need to watch a video to know how cats move. So I did spend some time checking cat jumps in various situations. So I decided to start from the landing pose of the cat so that the interpolation itself would be a good base for me to devise the remaining poses. Notice how I'm using a secondary master to position the cat in the landing position while the primary master stays constrained to the log itself. Also notice how I zero out the pose of the cat to start anew because the last position was all twisty. I really want to start from a clean slate in this position. I also kept animating the log as the fish was hitting the log and, and I also created a pose for the log so that it was already slanted a little bit as the cat was landing on it. It's worth noting that at this stage I'm actually doing the blocking of the head in global so that even if I rotate the body around the head stays rotated independently and that makes it a lot easier for me at this stage because I, the head is not inheriting every single rotation of the chest. In the landing pose, I really want to have a mischievous face for the cat, so I did refer back to the character sheet from the art director. And I want the pose to be relatively tense in here. You see, I keep checking the 3D view just to make sure that this all makes sense in 3D, because at, this, at a certain stage, this cat will have to rotate by 180 degrees, and the splining will be incredibly difficult if I don't make sure that this works in 3D. The cat is going to sport a very worried expression the moment it realizes it's in troubles and I can cannibalize that expression from another scene. My opinion being that anytime that there is some work that you already have done, it's a good idea to reuse it somehow, even if just as a base. But let's imagine that I have to do, I don't know, 30 expressions for this shot. And every expression takes me, let's say, 10 minutes to make. That's 300 minutes. That's five hours of work. So if I can spare myself some of that work, I will certainly be happier. Not to mention that the facial expressions I'm importing have been already approved in another shot, so they are bound to be on character. Now I can devise an anticipation pose, followed by a kickoff, and then finally I will have the contact pose. I really want to keep the head aiming at the target throughout the whole jump, like cats do usually. Finally, I will figure out the up pose. I can already tell at this stage that I will have some troubles splining this. It's a 180 degrees rotation of a full character on a very narrow platform. This is going to give me headaches later on, I already know that. Once I have the key poses, I'm back to do some time sculpting through the timeline so that I give the animation some poses or I speed up certain areas. It's a good idea to do it now that I have very few poses rather than later when I will have an immense amount of keys. Once the cat has landed on the log, it is time to animate the log rotating, twisting down. And I realize that I don't have a surface of water there. So I create a cube in there to give me a reference point for where the water is. This way I will have a reference point and I will know when the cat will feel like seeking a safer spot. When the cat has decided it will hug the tree, 
to maybe try and counteract the motion of the log, I want to make sure that the cat keeps staring at the fret, which is the water, and once the log goes vertical, it will start sinking, thus bringing the bum of the cat down closer to the water. It will be at that stage that I want to lift the bum a little bit, just to show the cat trying to avoid water. Once the cat finds that it's inevitable, to hit the water, it will perch on top of the log. This perching pose is quite difficult to make because the, the rig is not designed to compress that much, but all in all, it kind of works. And I really want to have a nice bent line of action in this spine. And I want the head to feel as if it's between the shoulders, as if the character is very, very worried. And for this reason, I also lowered the ears. I want to give the impression that every part of the cat is worried. Eventually the fish will come out. And that's when I realized that I have to rework the pose of the cat a little bit because they will have to interact. There's the possibility that some intersections will become visible. So placing the fish there already is is a good idea in my opinion because it lets me understand how my perched pose needs improvement. There was a conversation going on with the director in here because I wasn't quite convinced of the physics behind this. It's very difficult for a log to stay vertical if you see what I mean. That's not a regular rest state for such an object. But at the end of the day, both the art director and the director wanted to have the log stay in vertical. So we went down that road. It's good to know that at this stage, I already have animated the log moving and I already took into account the weight of the cat on the log when I animated the log. And if I take a step back, it's clear that the story starts to get together, the poses starts to be readable. So I feel like I'm going in the right direction, more or less. I'm a bit worried about the geometry because it's a bit wrinkly in this pose and I am aware that we're using a specific shader that has outlines as well as a certain amount of texturing going on. So I want to make sure that the wireframe is nice and organized even in this difficult pose. That's why you see me using wireframe on top of the geometry. That's because I want to make sure the shader behaves in a proper way. And this way I minimize the chances of a technical retake. Now, once the fish emerges, I want the cat to feel embarrassed at what just happened. So I want to have a very noticeable change of emotion in the face, going maybe from just being worried about the water to a genuine embarrassment towards the fish due to what just happened. And I was thinking of some references for this and the I'll make a man out of you sequence from Mulan seemed Apt. So I had a look at the scene in which Mulan is embarrassed because Mushu is unfairly helping her and I thought maybe I could do a similar thing. So I squished the facial expression similarly in order to create that contrast. Now the problem with facial expressions is that it's very difficult to get eye lines to work, that is the direction of the, of the gaze of characters. So I felt at this stage it was time to let the cat be for a little bit and focus on the facial expressions of the fish so that when the moment came in which the fish and the cat would be staring at one another, then I would be able to set the eye lines correctly. I have the extreme poses of the fish, so I can start working on the breakdowns and decide how the fish is going to emerge, which kind of poses it will have. I'm going to simulate a little bit of stretch and squash on the fish. Again, these characters are not designed to do that, but I'm going to keep it very subtle in here and fairly short on the timeline. I really wanted to animate a take on the cat when the fish comes out. Because the water being such a big worry, I really needed a big reaction for the change of focus to be believable. After the fish has checked the cat and the environment, the fish has an idea. And I really wanted to show that. So I kept the eyebrows of the fish deliberately higher at the beginning so that when it's squinted down to show that the fish is thinking something, the change will be evident and the audience can't miss it. Before the fishes jump, I want to have a little bit of anticipation. So I'm squashing the whole pose. And then I'm creating the contact pose of the fish hitting the water, as well as the landing pose. And then I work my way through the breakdowns leading to that pose. I really need the fish to land into the water and come back up relatively quickly because this way the scene can progress. 
and the focus can go back to the cat because the problem is that at this stage the fish will be giving us the back. Please notice how I keep going back to studio library to import facial expressions and thus spare myself. Once the cat realizes what goes on, I really want the facial expression and the general attitude to change. So I go for a rather squinty pose to a wide-eyed pose. Also, I'm stretching the torso so that it feels like there is a lot more tension in the body overall. And I'm making the pupils very, very narrow just to simulate an inward change of emotion. As I animate the trunk going up, I want the head to stay stable because the body will be the first part to be pushed up and the head will be instead stabilized. And now I can have a look at the blocking so far. Please notice how parts of the animation are in spline and parts of the animation are in stepped. And that's because I essentially animated the log straight ahead while the cat is animated pose to pose and the fish is half the way between the two. At the beginning it's made by a loop that I recycled and adapted so it's already splined but then as it's coming out of the log I wanted to read the poses and plot down the poses before going too deep into detail. So you see how there are several different layers of detailing in this blocking. I also need this blocking to be detailed enough and clear enough so that the art director and the director who are maybe not used to interpret animation, especially a blocking, can take an informed decision about what's going to happen. It would be fair for them to be able to green light an animation they understand rather than a blocking that the animator maybe has very clearly in mind but it's not quite there on the screen. So I feel like we are nearly there and in fact this is when I did show the first version to the director and the art director. I, I told them, look, this is what's going to happen more or less. Do you like it or do you want anything to be different? In a matter of hours, I received feedback from the director and the biggest note that I received from the director was about the cat flying out. The director preferred the cat to fly out sideways rather than vertically. Now at the end of this shot, there is another shot which is supposed to seamlessly cut with this one in which both characters are emerging from underneath and the camera is high up in the sky. So that's why initially I did block the animation to fly up vertically because I was concerned for continuity. But the director was fine with having the cat leave sideways and then just have it come from underneath at a later stage. The time between the two actions being big enough for them to be read without too much of a conflict default. Other things the director wanted to change was an improvement on the facial expression here at the beginning of the shot, which makes a lot of sense. It looked a bit spooky as it was here. The director correctly flagged a problem with the tail, which I'm going to solve later again. Then again, some facial expressions on the fish. And that was about it. Everything else was working fine with the director and art director. So I was quite happy because it meant we could progress. So now I am designing some sort of kickoff pose for the cat to leave the log. I want that pose to look relatively out of control and I really want the cat to swing its arms and limbs in an effort to try and regain balance. At the same time though, I want the facial expression to be very well readable. So I'm trying to keep the head as stabilized as I can. So I've planned the end pose out of screen and I planned the kickoff pose. And now you see I'm introducing breakdowns in which the cat is desperately trying to regain composure. Here I'm checking if the various poses are working. I'm quite happy about the general posing in here and about the fact that the head is stabilized and it's readable. I'm not super happy about the arc and the general way the body pose is read. So here I'm tracking the single limbs and making sure that the arc as the body travels through space. And I want to really extend the legs out so that they break the silhouette and they are more readable. Generally speaking, when I animate this kind of actions where the characters have to leave the screen, I always animate after they have left the screen so that I don't get stuck trying to figure out the last frames of leaving the screen, but I actually have them interpolated and then I can use the interpolation to build the poses. Once I feel the limbs are in a decent position, I'm going to use the master to just plot a decent arc. I'm not very happy of the way I'm working here to be honest because the master is offset compared to the character so that makes it a lot harder to track the arcs and I'm finding that solving this problem they fly out is more difficult than I thought. 
at this stage, I am positively tired. I have worked for about six, seven hours without too many breaks. I've been talking to the director. I've been fixing a rig issue with the tail. So I've been dealing with a lot of things. And so I take a break from this action I'm not very happy with. And after having partially addressed the biggest note from the director, I go back and address the smaller notes, which as you can see, relates to a facial expression and an eye line. So I'm going to fix that. You see, I posted the animation on scene sketch so that the director could draw straight on it. My idea at this stage being that I'm fairly tired and that trying to fix the jump of the cat at the end is a bit too difficult for the state of mind I'm in. So I might as well fix little stuff before calling it a day. So I'm tweaking poses here and there. You see, I'm moving the, the whole character through its master. And I'm trying to create separation between the cat and the fish as the fish emerges. And one sure sign that I'm tired at this stage is that I am play blasting a lot, as if I'm trying to take a break from my own job in here. I feel like when I do a lot of play blasts is because I'm not quite sure where I'm going. Nevertheless, it seems to me that the shot is coming together. And since I'm tired in here, I'm making a note to myself to remind myself of using a single control for the log for as long as the log doesn't come out of water. This way I won't have to spline a number of curves on a number of controls. I can always space convert the animation, of course, but that again is one more step. We are about seven hours and a half in, in here and I'm still fairly tired, I remember. So I'm thinking maybe one thing that I can do is to polish the animation of the log a little bit. That's an easy prop to animate. And then I will figure out maybe the rest of the animation for the characters tomorrow. Another part that is relatively easy to take care of at this stage is the one of the fish getting stuck into the log. It's pure reaction. So I do not need to do any complex acting in there, hopefully. So I'm just creating a squashed pose for the fish when it gets stuck the first time. And then a bit of an anticipation with the tail to start a more furious flapping of the tail at the end to try to get through. One of the issues of working with pre-made loops and trying to mix them with animation layers is that it's very easy to create animation that doesn't have very strong poses because everything is moving all the time. And I kind of feel that this part of the animation in particular has that problem. The posing could have been a bit stronger for the fish, but at the same time, this is a super low budget project and I really need to finish this shot. So I feel compelled to take decisions there as to what's more important for the shot rather than trying to polish everything. I really wanted to try and animate in the fins as if they were hands holding onto the log. So eventually I did constrain the fish left fin to grab onto the log. Then of course I have to deform the top fin so that it feels like it doesn't intersect the log and it squishes through the aperture of the log. I'm adding a little bit of stretch and squash just to make the effort more visible. And that stretch and squash happens at all levels in the body and in the tail fins. Then of course I have to tweak a little bit the animation of the grass blade that the fish always carries around. But that's one thing I do really for last because the grass blade animation depends on anything else in the shot. I do not really want to spend time doing that earlier than necessary. That's why I didn't even touch it at the beginning. Also, when I'm working on a multi-character scene and the blocking is sort of sorted, I tend to unreference the other characters and just focus on one character so that I get the best performance I get from Maya. I kind of feel that at this stage, neither Maya or Blender are particularly fast in evaluating animation on screen. And, that's, and that for me is really a bummer because I find that play blasting a lot is really time consuming and doesn't really help me as much as it should. So I would really like to have real time feedback in camera. Now I can go back to the second part of the animation and I want to fine tune the fish a little bit. The general motion of the body was working, but as the fish compresses and stretches, I want to make sure that the side fins are holding onto the log again as if they were hands. So I need to constrain them. There are plenty of constraints in this shot. In general, when I work with constraints, I prefer prefer not to put any constrained object on a layer because then when I merge down the layer, the constraints usually break. There are ways to go around that problem. You see, I'm using the fins as if they were hands. You see that the hands have a different geometry from the rest of the body. We decided to rig the fins that way so that they could be used as hands if need be. Since the camera will never show us that the fins are in fact separated in this shot, you see how much distance there is between the fin itself and the body which doesn't make any sense in a physical space, but it works camera-wise. Also, I'm trying to get the fins to bend as if they were fingers. So this 
in theory will provide some sort of anticipation for the fish coming out of the log. Something will move on the upper edge of the log, thus attracting the attention of the audience. That means that the audience will be already looking there by the time the fish comes out. You see that while I'm working on the general timing of the body, I don't even have the facial expressions visible because I don't need to see them. They are just slowing the performance of the viewport. And once I feel I have the right timing in, I can enable the facial expressions again. Once the fish is out, I really want it to scout around. That is, first look maybe into the camera a little bit, breaking the fourth wall, then checking the friend, the cat, the clumsy cat, and then checking the environment around and then have the idea. And I want these story beats to be very readable. I haven't figured out the final motion of the log yet. And generally speaking, I'm secretly fearing that the log movement to the left following an arc will compete with the cat's movement moving to the right on the opposite and almost symmetrical arc. I felt as if when the cat was being shot straight up like a rocket, we had a very straight line going up, making the cat really readable, and the log would just be somebody we leave behind following a non-important arc. And now I feel like I will have to face that issue as, as well. But at the same time, I'm aware that the director and the art director are happy with this decision and they don't want the cat to fly up straight as a rocket. So since the feedback is clear, I can no longer go back to the rocket cat. The general emotion of the fish jumping out going underwater and coming back up works, so I'm adding a little bit of overlap in there. And since I don't need very precise overlap because the fish is essentially a little sphere with a little bit of tail, I'm just going to make the key poses and then see if that works. So I'm not going to resort to any fancy script in there. In general, I find that if you do the extreme poses of any overlapping motion, then you just need one or two breakdowns and you're done. Although I do use overlapping scripts for a lot of the work anyway, because it's just faster, of course. And in fact, you will find a link to the ever useful overlapper in the description of this video. As far as I can tell, animation is always a trade-off between these two factors, the control you want to have on the posing and the animation, and the efficiency, the time that you have. You never quite have enough time to make things look perfect, that's the issue. Now I can call the cat back and try and see what happens in the jump. The jump is going to give me a lot of pain, I already know that. I really want to make sure that before the jump we see a little bit of an anticipation with the bum of the cat being high up and then we want to see the bum going down and the cat sort of gliding along an arc. Notice how the red dot of the bum is moving a lot more at the beginning of the motion when we need to feel the anticipation rather than after the jump when we really want the green dot to move the most because of the contacting action. So pose to pose, I go in there and I tweak the contacts and general line of action. I am practically sculpting the shape of the cat at this stage, especially spine wise. I'm making sure as well that the legs are not twinning too much, that there is still a differentiation between the two legs. It proved fairly difficult to shape the thigh so that it would the form that much and for the kickoff pose I really stretched the cat a little bit. I didn't quite pose the tail too much at this stage and the initial rotation of the body of the cat actually takes place in 3D space. This way I thought it would have been easier to spline. In the meantime I was also moving ahead and checking some references of cats again just to check what the next pose would have been in this case. And after seeing the first play blast I did realize that I found it difficult to evaluate the moving parts of the cat so I created some dummy scenes that I parted to the chest, the bum and the head so that when I worked on the timing of the individual parts I could see a lot more clearly without distraction what the relationships were within the parts. Please notice how I'm working in 3D to improve my chances of getting a quicker splining. This way I won't have to cheat as much in camera. And I thought once I have these proxy parts moving, that's when I will know the cat is in a good position. At the end of the day, everything can be broken down to connected bouncing balls, if you think of it. So I thought maybe this is a good way to operate. And it really did help me. I could really evaluate the stretch factor quite a lot better this way. Please notice how I often go back to the top view. And here I'm doing some more sculpting on the shape to, to exacerbate the stretching, for instance. Once the main action is sculpted out, I took some time to tweak the poses of the individual legs. 
it would not have made sense to tweak the legs beforehand too much because if the body was in the wrong position then there was no point in posing the legs. So with quadrupeds I do tend to leave the legs for last unless of course the positioning of the leg is a storytelling feature. For instance for the contact pose I did try to pose the legs in a precise manner because the contact pose relies on the legs contacting the floor. Tweaking the front legs for contact took a little bit of trial and error because I really wanted to make them feel stretched, so I had to cheat the position of the clavicle quite a lot. I wanted to make sure that we felt a bit of the momentum being absorbed by the legs bending after the contact, and every now and then I go back to the 3D view and check that everything looks in order. Also, I wanted to create a little bit of a separation between the action of the two back legs. In practice, in real life, the two back legs often land together, but in here it felt a bit too tweeny, if you see what I mean. When doing play blasts for this action, I actually zoomed in on the action itself. I was really interested in seeing it up close. Then later on I will be doing play blasts from the actual camera. At this stage I remember it felt to me like I had it more or less. Of course it wasn't refined, but I had the key poses at the extremes from the beginning and the end of the motion. And I had some poses in the middle of some breakdowns. So I felt confident I could move on to the next transition, which was the transition between realizing that things weren't that fine and the hugging the tree back. And I really wanted to stretch the cat towards the next pose. So you see, I'm trying to reach the contact again with the front legs, and then I'm leaving the bum behind a little bit. Again, reaching an appealing pose with the thigh proved time consuming. Just adding a contact pose and a breakdown between the realization that the cat is in trouble and the hugging pose made a big deal of difference. And at this stage, I felt confident that I was heading in the right direction, so I kept tweaking the pose until satisfied. For this transition, I really wanted to make the cat transition as if it was going through some sort of funnel being compressed right in the middle and then coming out a little bit bigger or rather in model, I would say. So I tried to stretch it as much as the situation allowed for. And in general, even with my students, I do ask them what's the plan to go from pose A to pose B? How do they plan to go there? Just to make sure that we have a clear picture of how we go from one place to another and we are not just linearly interpolating in a software. Even breakdowns have to have a mood. At this stage, I'm relying more and more on the selection sets from Unimbot. I would normally use a selection to shelf script or studio library for this kind of tasks, but I was trying out Unimbot at home and I thought, why not? After the hugging pose, I wanted to make sure that the cat was showing us how worried it was about the water. So I had the log sink down into the water, and at the moment in which the bum of the cat was tangent in water, I wanted the bum to raise, as in to try to get just the bum away from water. I thought that would have made for a more convincing character who is afraid of water. And at this stage, I am convinced this could indeed be a good idea if supported by the body motion. Well, I'm ready to pose out the transition between the hugging pose and the perching pose. However, there is a little bit of a problem. So far, I used a combination of master motion and local control motions to move the cat around the log. The main master is always constrained to the log and the secondary master moves around. However, at this stage, I did move the secondary master around quite a lot. So I am using Morgan Loomis's World Bake tool to bake the local controls down to locators and then delete the animation of the master and finally reinstate the animation on the local controls using those very same locators. It is a very practical way to do space switching and this means that I can focus on certain parts of animations and solve them through controls that are convenient to me, say the master for instance, and then for other parts I can just bake the animation of the controls, delete the animation of the master which I no longer need, and then bake the animation back onto local controls. This technique is something that I routinely teach because I think especially for creature animation is quite important. And now I can focus on the movement leading to the perched up pose. And the first thing I really want to solve is the kickoff pose of the hind legs. Here I'm moving the head away as much as I can so that I can see the shape of the body a lot better. 
I might have as well selected the faces and hit them. In here I really wanted to give the sense of urgency, so I wanted the character to stretch and at the same time I wanted it to look back at the water. And while the animation is far from perfect, I think the kickoff and contact pose in this transition as well already seems to work okay. It's amazing how much you can get away with just by stretching the character and keeping consistent kickoff and contact poses in fact. Of course one would like to spend an infinite amount of time on every single pose, but this animation needs to be delivered in a matter of two, three days, so I can't spend too much time on it, and I really want to get to a first pass of some sort of second blocking or first splining before thinking of refining it too much. So in here I'm taking care of the reaction of the cat to the fish arriving, and of the transition between the embarrassment of the cat and the cat realizing that there is a problem. Once that's sorted, I can take care of the arc of the log flying away. And again, before going any further, I really think I should be looking at the whole picture now. And what I find myself with in here is some sort of 50-50% splining slash blocking, for which, for instance, the facial emotions are still in blocking. You can see that the transitions are still stepped, while the body is at times in stepped and at times in spline. In general, I'm not really particular about whether I should be watching everything in stepped or in linear or in whichever tangent. I find it that depending on the shot, one may watch it in stepped or linear or another tangent. In my opinion, you should always use the tools that are most effective in that situation. And I thought that leaving the facial expressions in stepped while keeping the body a, a bit more in spline was actually a good idea because it gave me already an idea of when things should change and also which kind of problems I'm going to encounter with splining. Speaking of which, it is time to go and check that arc of the cat leaving the frame at the end of the shot. And first I'm tweaking it out with the master, and then I'm going back to the proxy spheres and to Unimbot's motion trail to make sure that the cat is indeed following an arc, and to make sure that I am controlling the stretch and squash. As the log pushes upwards, I really want the head to stay behind and stay compressed. So hopefully when the character springs to the right, it will also have a little bit of stretch. Once that's sorted, I make sure the limbs are swinging as they grasp at the air. Keep checking this thing in 3D. I want the limbs swinging to be something that works in 3D, so that when I will be refining it, it will hopefully make some logical sense in 3D space. I find myself really struggling with this part of the animation, but at the same time I feel that the general motion of the shot and the characters, although not clean nor perfect, is still clear and descriptive enough, so potentially if I had to deliver in a rush that could almost work I would say. The thing that doesn't work for sure is the facial expressions, so I am now focusing on the facial expressions themselves, so that they will be no longer blocking but rather they will move into spline. So now I make sure that whenever there is a change of eye direction the eyes are following some sort of arc, and I'm making sure there are anticipations and there are extreme poses being hit in the face, and I'm making sure in general that the line of action of the eyes makes some sense. The ears are really helping in here to give an impression of surprise and curiosity. And in general, this is quite an important story beat because the cat is eyeing something that happened behind it. The next relevant facial transition, in my opinion, is the one in which the cat goes from stalking to be worried about the new development of the log turning. And in there I really want it to be wide-eyed, so to create that nice contrast between the crunchy stalky pose and the worried one. I remember that at this stage I wasn't quite convinced about the head turn, and I did spend some time tweaking it. In fact this kind of cleanup, in my opinion, is a bit premature, mostly because I was committed to the face at that stage, and, and probably a wiser approach would be to tweak the face throughout the whole shot at this stage, so that I bring the face at the same level of the body. And instead, for whichever reason, I decided to fix both the head and the body in that section. At the same time, it is true that during the turn, the head was in a full gimbal lock, so it was very difficult to spline, so I did feel the pressure of bringing the head under control, which I did through Unimbot's simple control. In practice, it lets you create a control in the space you desire, and then transfers the animation to that space. So again, once more, we see space switching is at play in here. And the Playblast itself confirms that indeed, in general, the animation kind of works, although it needs some love, but the facial emotions are still at a premature stage. So off we go to another pass on the face, just to keep the poses for longer and create more explosive transitions. 
This rig wasn't really designed for heavy duty facial animation. In fact, this is the same rig we have in game. So animating facials is not properly a joy in here. And I can't even complain because I did rig the face. When the cat is perching up, I really want the facial expression to stay as concerned as possible. So I want to cut the lower part of the eyelids and I want to keep the teeth really tense. And for the embarrassed expression, remember I was checking the Mulan reference. In order to reach the mouth worried expression, I am actually rotating by 90 degrees the smile expression. This way, in game, we can use one texture for both expressions. The only trick in here is that I will have to make sure that the transition happens in step in game, so not to see any funky interpolations there. For the transition between embarrassed and surprised of the action of the fish, I really wanted to do some sort of regular take with a bit of sideways nodding. I guess you could call it a shaking take. And that means also that I need a stronger anticipation in the face, so I need to crunch the facial expression. I have to say that while I was at the early stages of this animation, that kind of take was working quite all right, but by the end of the shot, I felt like the splining kind of washed it out, which is a bit of a shame. As I'm working on the embarrassed expression, I find it difficult to find the eyeliner of the cat and that's mainly because I don't have the character the cat is supposed to be looking at so I am re-enabling the fish so that I'm sure I will be able to get an outline that works between the two characters. It is essential that the two characters are looking at one another. Whenever creating a mouth expression I'm trying to make sure the mouth is not fully parallel to the eyes but rather skewed in one direction or another depending on how the eyebrows are placed. When Furple the cat goes from sort of concerned about the actions of the fish to fully aghast because of the problem with the log, I want to make sure that the facial expressions are different enough. And part of the difference that I managed to strike comes from the fact that first I really crushed the facial expression so that I'm telling the audience, look, there's something going on in there. And then as I open up, the pupils are a lot smaller than they used to be in the previous facial expression. So although they are going to be in a similar place if compared to the previous facial expression, their size is going to be so different that the audience can't miss it. Then as Furple is being thrown away, I want to keep the same facial expression. While animating this, I remember thinking that changing a facial expression there would make the expression difficult to read because the character was traveling across the screen. I also wanted to make sure that Furple was compressing as much as possible as the log was coming up initially, so that there would be more contrast later on when Furple was flying. And while a quick play blast confirms that the facial expressions are in a decent position, it also now underlines how the cat is a bit floaty. And that happens quite a lot, for which you maybe fix one part, say the body, and then you realize that without facial expressions, you don't quite know where to go. So you add some details on the facial expressions, you add some breakdowns and some key poses. And in my experience, fixing one side makes the problems on the other side a bit more evident. The bigger the problem, the sooner I approach it. Now that Furple the cat is in a decent position, I want to make sure that the facial expressions of Finn the fish are also taken care of. So the director was very clear about what they wanted. They wanted Finn to look into the camera and observe the surrounding. On my side instead, I wanted to make sure that as Finn was observing the surrounding, it was clear that he saw the possibility of pranking Furple the cat. And crouching the eyebrows down and keeping them there was exactly what I thought could give us that feeling. Luckily, once Finn is jumping, you don't really have to care much about his facial expressions anymore. Again, the play blast confirms that facial animation is in a decent position. However, the body motion of Furple is still fairly floaty and would need a couple of pushes here and there. Of course, that's because we didn't touch it yet. So after a quick pass on the grass blade that Finn always keeps lodged in his mouth, I can finally dedicate some attention and energy to speeding up certain areas of Furple the cat. And now it's time to fix the jump of Furple the cat. So the jump was fairly floated to begin with. So one thing that I thought I could have been doing was to select all controls, make sure that the key poses were keyed on all controls on every channel, and then convert the keys in the middle in breakdowns. So the approach I followed to speed up this animation was to save the key poses by keying every control on every channel on the key poses, then delete any key that was not particularly necessary during the transition and keep only the breakdowns, which I converted to Maya breakdowns. This way, by moving the key poses, the breakdowns automatically adapt on the timeline 
Of course, in the graph editor itself, there are other tools to perform retiming, like for instance, the lattice or those vertical bars whose name I don't remember right now. I am space switching once more. This time around, I am space switching the bum and the chest of the cat again, using the additional controls that Animbot lets you create. This way I can animate those controls in a space which is the one I choose rather than the master space, which maybe is uncomfortable right now. And now the jump is finally a little bit less floaty. It's far from perfect, of course, but at least it's not as floaty as it was. And now it's a good time to fix the camera because the director wanted the cat to go into a bush to the right hand side of the screen. So I created a few spheres and just animated them to simulate the fact that there is something in there so that the director could see it also in Unity. And then of course I make a little bit of a play blast to check. And at this stage, I'm still not satisfied with the animation of the cat. I still feel like I should increase the delay of the bum of the cat as it jumps and I should probably make the jump a little bit snappier. So you see I'm working on the bum itself. Actually I'm working on additional controllers created by Animbot and I'm also making sure that there is a little bit of delay between the two legs in order to make it look a little bit less mechanical. A couple of tweaks on the bum of the cat and then I'm ready to evaluate the play blast again. I am really making sure that the shape of the cat as it's perched up the log up there makes some sense and doesn't result in something a bit strange to look at because I'm a bit worried that once we apply that sort of Fresnel shader in game, any issue with the wireframe will show up. And at this stage, I am practically ready to deliver. I calculated about 14 to 16 hours to deliver the shot, so I can't really spend too much time on it. Throughout this project, I used a lot the temporary controls of Animbot so that I could spline in world space a bunch of controls from the cat. Now that I am practically ready to deliver, it's the only moment when I want to spend some time doing the tail, you see, and I only do the key poses. I am not really interested in doing very fine details in there. I design key poses and I use the twin machine to deliver breakdowns. I could have used an automated tool like Overlapper to do it, to be honest, but I figured I would have had better control on the single poses if I didn't. I want to make sure that the tail is visible in the silhouette as the cat leaves the log. And again, a quick look at the plate bust seems to suggest that doing the key poses and some breakdowns alone is already quite good for the tail. I want to make sure that the tail feels like it's resting on the log at the beginning of the shot because that part needs to give us a very relaxed character. And then I want to add some overlapping action in the ears. This time around, I'm actually using overlapper because the main pose of the ears is already jotted down. I was checking the playlist and I realized that the arcs of the face aren't as good as I wanted them. So I created some sort of red clown nose to make sure that I could easily track the face action there. I used the motion trail from Animbot to track that action. And now I'm doing a pass over the ears to generate a bit more readable poses. This new pass I am making on an animation layer. So in practice on the base animation layer, I have the overlapper motion, which is semi-automatic. And then on a further animation layer, I do the pose itself. So hopefully the base animation layer takes care of the secondary motion of the ears while the additional animation layer actually does the posing itself. It would have been more logic to do the opposite. So again, I'm doing key poses on the animation layer. Of course, a tool like Overlapper does not know whether a pose is in character or it has the right energy. So I find that while those tools make me spare a lot of work, at the same time, you still have to go in there and decide what's the line of action and what's the general mood of that pose. You have to still design the pose yourself. Also, Overlapper made the ears a little bit too twisty. It is possible I am not finding the right settings. Then I wanted to make a very quick pass on the head as purple is on the log. And finally, I am ready to deliver. And here you are seeing me executing a script that does some fancy pre-bake of certain aspects of the rig so that when I export the FBX to Unity, I get the curves that I need. In fact, I cannot do the key reduction in Unity because I cannot easily tell Unity to avoid reducing the facial expressions. Remember that facial expressions are driven by sprites, so they should transition in stepped. And if Unity starts reducing keys on my animation, of course, once in game, the facial expressions will be all over the place. And now we are down to exporting the FBX itself. I've already exported the join chain 
and the geometry of the rig in a T pose. So all I need to do here after doing my fancy pre-bake is to export the joint chain of each character. In here I'm also exporting the bushes so that the art director has some sort of visual feedback in game. And then I'm finally making a play blast after the baking just to make sure that the baking script didn't break anything. This is a script I made and at the stage you're seeing the script in action, it was one of the first times I was using it. So of course I wasn't quite sure that there weren't any bugs. When I look at this kind of stuff, I feel all nostalgic because although this animation took place just a few months ago, it feels like ages. There are so many things I would do in a different way now. I had to do several re-exports to make sure that I found the right settings. I also took advantage of this shot to create FBX exporting presets. So now depending on the data I have to export, I have a different animation preset. And of course I did double check the FBXs in Maya before going into Unity. And now we can have a look at the final result. The last part of the animation when the two characters are flying above the forest is something I've animated in a previous session so I'm not going to cover it in this tutorial. And that's it for this video, I hope you have found it useful, if that's the case please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell and share this video with your friends. If you're interested in River Tales the game you can download the alpha demo from itch.io. You can also support them on Kickstarter, find all links in the description below. And if you liked the video or the game, please let me know in the comments below. Bye, have fun!